Hello and welcome to Diminishing Returns. It's an outtake special, that means we go back into the archives and find some choice cuts that didn't make the episodes, usually because we go off on a tangent about something completely irrelevant, but hopefully it's entertaining or amusing to our regular listeners. So I've got all sorts of things lined up for you here, including some sexy Fifty Shades outtakes. But let's start with zombies. So some time ago we did a whole George A. Romero trilogy and the first clips here are from our Night of the Living Dead episode. If you'd like to hear more of this then go back and listen to episode 228. Here we go. But Night of the Living Dead is, of course, the first real zombie movie. George A. Romero is a remarkable, remarkable man for essentially creating a genre of films. I I, I really can't think of a, a single film that has invented a genre as prolific as Night of the Living Dead with the zombie genre. I don't know if you can think of anything. The closest I can think of is Groundhog Day invented the time loop genre, to the best of my knowledge, and that has about 12 <laughs> films in it. Well, I mean, did he... I mean, maybe we should talk about zombies in cinema before Night of the Living Dead, because I think he popularised a certain kind of zombie, but from my understanding, like, you know, Bela Lugosi's White Zombie being an obvious example, um, the Vincent Price uh, I Am Legend film, which wasn't called that, what was it called? Uh, It was called The Last Man on Earth. Ah, that's the one, yeah. I mean, of course, the book itself, I Am Legend, was Mm. a huge influence on Night of the Living Dead to the point, I I think they've said things to the effect of we tried to figure out the kind of safest way to rip off I Am Legend, (laughs) like, so that we wouldn't get sued. Yeah, I mean, look, they, they, they remixed things in there that they were aware of, absolutely, everyone does, but I think this is still a very definitive landmark in pop culture. I would argue the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is a, a ah. zombie movie from mm. uh, the 20s yeah, there. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what zombies used to be in sort of like 1930s cinema. They would be sort of reanimated dead people mm. who would often be, you know, the servant to the mad scientist or whatever. Yeah, yes, well, well yeah, that, that, actually, that, that's yeah. what zombies were in general, you know? It, it wasn't a film thing. Zombies were a concept in voodoo mythology course the living dead have existed in various forms throughout history and mythology obviously not in real life Mm. and white zombie and things were were drawing upon that and i think to the best of my knowledge i think the earliest zombie movie going unless there's some biblical adaptation with lazarus in there or or jesus that i'm not aware of there was a frankenstein film made in 1910 i think hmm and of course, famously, Alan Partridge argues that Frankenstein's monster is a type of zombie, which is, you know, quite right. He's a, a mishmash of different reanimated parts. But yeah, then you've got Dr. Caligari from the 20s, which, uh, what was that, 21? I'm just like that. 1920, sorry. Mm. Uh, seminal bit of German expressionism. Uh, great film, actually. I love Dr. Caligari. Mm, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, so ghouls existed, the living dead zombies did exist in films, but they had never, to the best of my knowledge, been shown eating people before. And Mm. they weren't an infectious plague before. That all is Night of the Living Dead. And obviously the plague element, the the idea that they turn you into one of them, that is them ripping off I Am Legend. And the flesh-eating, I think they just came up with. Despite the film's uh, sort of public domain status that we've you were already covered at the top of this, Sol, um, I do just kind of want to point out that even though you can, I'm sure you can go on and watch it all on YouTube for free or whatever kind of dodgy site, I think if you can find a really good quality version of mm, it, I have the mm. Criterion Edition Blu-ray, which is, it looks phenomenal and it's really well remastered yeah, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, so I do recommend seeing it in some kind of uh, format yeah. like that if you can. Well, I got a cheap DVD version. Um, well, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I really liked about it, and this comes with, down to lighting, I guess, but it's, it's yeah. to do with the low-budget nature of it. It's obviously reminiscent of film noir, which is kind of the same circumstances, cheap and low-budget lighting. But it really has some beautiful, atmospheric, very artistic shots mm. and in, in lots of dark shadow with just a little bit of light on someone's face. And It speaks back to the likes of Dr. Caligari. It's yeah. got a real yeah. German, oh, oh, German expressionism, expressionism I, I feel about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
which is what like the film last stuff was going back to but it was driven by limitation rather than a, a deliberate artistic choice and i think that's probably the same truth here but that doesn't mean it can't be great and artistic mm. and there's some i cuz i when i go through these films i i will try and find little snapshots so that uh, i'm thinking of stuff that to post on the instagram and all that and i found some beautiful shots from mm. this that are just like just a oh, little God, artistic I, I it, piece yeah. in in itself yeah really nice stuff to say it's so kind of shoddily filmed yeah. <laughs> in the sense of the budget. yeah you know i i completely agree i i i feel much the same way about evil dead i think which is yeah a nice comparison that we've well you made and i made again and i'm making again now but mm-hmm. um it, you know I, if i ever had a dedicated filmmaker office to work with and i was decorating it with let's say i didn't put posters of films up around the room and i went for stills from films i would mm-hmm absolutely have a few stills from this one i think there's so many shots that just i mean not only are just composed lovely but there's shots in this film that have stayed with me obviously zombies freaked me out and terrified me as a kid but i you know i I didn't come to watch a night of the living dead until i was much older and i think it scares me more now than it did when i first watched it if that makes sense I, i think i get more into the atmosphere of it now and the bleak political undertones and everything all kind of a affect me more now. And it's to the point that at the start of the coronavirus pandemic, I I was finding things quite, you know, not unbearably so, but there was a definite stress uh, that I could feel just weighing on me in the back of my mind. And I, I just had this urge to go and watch zombie movies and i put on night of the living dead and the night eats the world and honestly after i watched night of the living dead it was like taking an aspirin when you've got a headache it was just like Hmm. right that's that's horror catharsis done i i feel so much better i've got it out of my system i've worked through this collective horror so yeah i i don't really know what i'm saying just that it's a very (laughs) effective film (laughs) i think it really does get under your skin quite well Mm. I liken it actually to uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is another horror yeah. film, um, n- not too many years later, uh, but it's got that same rough and ready style to it. Yeah. It's a similar kind of just a bunch of people want to make a movie in their local area and they get together and end up making something quite quite amazing, really groundbreaking. What I think is remarkable is that I think Night of the Living Dead is, I would say quite firmly, the start of that wave There was Mm. a real wave of, like, the start of modern horror in the 70s, I would say, Mm. with the likes of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Evil Dead towards the very end of the 70s, uh, Halloween. Mm. But Night of the Living Dead is from 1968, and it's really quite gory. (laughs) You know, I I, I never quite acknowledged that until recently. I mean, it's still got an 18 certificate here in the UK because of the gore. I, 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 I was reading the other day, I mean, I'd never really considered this. Obviously, this film was incredibly controversial when it came out. There's no surprise there, but See, I didn't realise. They they used to, of course, do the whole, you, you pay your ticket at the cinema, you go and watch mm. whatever, they'll have a, a matinee, you know, matinee afternoon movie on. And apparently they just whack on a horror movie in the afternoon before a main film. <laughs> and that was pretty standard. Kids would go to horror movies. Because, you know, horror movies back then were what? Frankenstein? The Invisible Man? They weren't terrifying. It was like a kid watching Goosebumps. And you just imagine, because this is what happened, a load of kids went to the cinema, or parents took their kids to the cinema to watch, I don't know, Doctor Doolittle or whatever was out at the time. And the pre-A movie, B movie, was Night of the Living Dead. And apparently kids were absolutely traumatized. And it it, it pretty much kick-started a a rejigging of the cinema system with regards to... um, Mm you know, the modern film certificate and having to be a certain age to buy a ticket and everything. That that seems to have largely started with the controversy surrounding this film's release in America. The title mm. lends itself to that B-movie thing, like, Night of the Living Dead, like the thing yes. from somewhere. It's yeah. It has a B-movie title as well. So you think it's going to be a kind of cheesy thing, mm. yeah. which I, th- but it's like you said, Sol, earlier, the, there is no humor to it at all. It's quite brutally mm. sincere, yeah. like the whole way through. And also it's realistic as in when they, yeah. Ki- yeah. when they batter someone to mm. death, it takes a bit of doing to batter someone's yeah. skull in as yeah. opposed to when everyone else in these other films were, you know, they're made of plasticine or whatever. Yeah. But I, I do really like them. I think that, again, it's something that really adds 
a, a reality to it and just the, even see, they're filming like the sheriff and he's going oh yeah we're gonna get we'll come around gonna get them there it's, yeah it, they're dead they're all messed up it really plays very realistically you know it's not like oh and here was an interview with the sheriff he's like he's, he's shouting at someone over there he's like oh yeah go get them boys it plays really nicely. The newsreader mm. has this classic American 60s newsreader kind of voice. You know, mm. it's to say it's done quite cheaply and it like with non-actors, it all works really nicely. I, I don't know how much of it was improvised, like maybe not newscasting, but like, oh, we're going to, you're the sheriff, we're going to record you. Like, just make sure you say this. It has a really devised feel to it in terms of acting. Like, it's like, it feels like when we see the character coming from the actor rather than the other way around, you know? I might be wrong, but I think that sheriff was played by someone on the production uh, rather than an actor. I'm, I'm just going to look that up and make sure I'm not talking out of my ass. But, you know, th- th- this, as I say, it was a film pulled together on a shoestring budget. And as a result, a lot of the people you see in front of the camera were members of crew. He, he, sorry, I, I've just found the sheriff was the film's production manager. I was correct. Nah. There we go. Mm. Well, that was actually proper film discussion, wasn't it? You can't have that. So let's do something a little more stupid. Let's go for a deeper cut and go back to our two-episode look at the Rocky films and a general discussion about boxing. Clearly, we don't know much about it. That was episode 129, so go and check that one out. Uh, Then, you know what? We can't have an outtakes episode without some Bond. So I'm going to give you a clip from our discussion of Die Another Day. That was episode 232. And then finally, uh, just an odd clip here. I'm not even sure where where it came from because I don't know why we were discussing it. We're talking about Fagan. People playing Fagan in Oliver Twist. I don't know. So enjoy that. So just, you should look up a boxer called Nikolai Valuev. Nikolai Zaluez. Valuev, V-A-L-U-E-V. He was a heavyweight champion for a while, a few years back. Is this going to be like Minute Bolt? <laughs> <laughs> he's seven foot tall and like built like a East Island statue. And he's like, he's just... The, you know the, picture, that's, the <laughs> picture of him that's come up looks like a... Um, I, d- I don't even know how to word it. Well, he, he apparently he was in a film once called Stonehead. Um, <laughs> guess what character he played? <laughs> <laughs> He looks like a British 1980s cartoon about a giant. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in these pictures, he looks like Jason Statham meets Pete Pothelthwaite. Pete Pothelthwaite, you said, yeah. Meets <laughs> Andre the Giant. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. see all of that, yeah. Plus, yeah. plus, he's like seven foot tall. Like He doesn't just he, look he, big. He has got big. the sloped brow of a Neanderthal, though, as well. He's got a very particular head yeah. shape. Well, he does. He he had like gigantic, some sort of pituitary thing, you know. I mean, right. he is like afflicted with something rather than it's just genetics. But yeah, he was a heavyweight champ for a while. Who do you think of winning a fight out of him and Manute Bowler? Uh, him. <laughs> <laughs> but who do you think would win in a basketball match? Probably him as well. <laughs> <laughs> Manute Ball. Manute Ball was very much <laughs> his role in the basketball team, was to stand near the hoop and stop <laughs> things going in by just knocking them away. <laughs> Who do you think would win in a dressing up as characters from Guardians of the Galaxy contest? Because <laughs> ob- one of them's obviously going to be Groot, the other one's going to be uh, Drax. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> he's in politics now, so... Well, that's it, he's come up here as Russian politician, Nikolai Valuev. Mm. But that's it, the Vlitch... the oh, the, the Klitschko brothers... The older one, Vladimir Klitschko, he's a polit- politician in Ukraine now. You know, they're quite well respected over in the Eastern Bloc. But we, we've got Frank Bruno and Chris Ubrick. You know the the Rocky statue that they put at the top yes, of the steps? the one in, that doesn't uh, look like him. In yes. the second film. <laughs> and even when he reveals it, he's a bit like, whoa, it's a Rocky statue. Jimmy Carter, <laughs> isn't it? They just kind of change <laughs> That that statue is is still there. Well, it's not it's not at the top of the steps, but they keep it 
at the the whatever that place is in Philadelphia, some and museum like, library place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's down at the bottom of the steps, like. But it is like those steps are generally known as the Rocky Steps now. It's yeah. a big thing. But they they put this statue up for the film, and then they removed it, and like they put it in a local museum, like it's a bit of memorabilia or whatever. And then they they put it back, and then then they've ended up having it there. There's this big debate of like, well. But Sylvester Stallone made this <laughs> for yeah. a film, and it's like a statue of no, himself but I, I, that he that's made, a, and now they've got it there. <laughs> I think that's a worthy thing to put there. It's a big cultural, like it's a massively significant piece of culture yeah. that's being represented but the, the, there. If, it's like if they a... decided, yeah, if they decided, like let's let's make some sort of you know statue for the Rocky films, or whatever. But th- the difference is that. Sylvester Stallone commissioned and paid for it, <laughs> albeit for a film. And it's just like, how many statues are there that are like paid for by the person it represents? Not that many, surely. But obviously, Stallone hasn't paid for it to be there as just a thing for him. It, it was no, just obviously he didn't mean that thing. to happen. But yeah. I just think it's an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've just you've just reminded me. Actually, Rocky Four. There was quite a well-known lawsuit over Rocky Four. Oh. Whereas there was a guy who wrote a spec script based on the Rocky character and sent it in. Well, not just sent it in, like had meetings with people at the studio. I had a meeting with Sylvester Stallone mm. about the script and nothing came of it. And then Rocky Four came out and he was like, wait a minute, this is my idea. What's going on? <gasps> so, he, so he sued and he didn't win. He lost the case on the basis that because his script was a spec script, it was non-commissioned, it was unsolicited, and it was based on the previous Rocky films... It was fan fiction, basically. It was, just, and he he was using characters that were copyrighted. Therefore, he had no right of copyright over it, even if he's created what? a new yeah. story. That that's bizarre, though, because like if you if you write a script for blah, 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 for Modern Family <laughs> or it's just just a show that's on the air, if you write a fan script for anything and send it in to the people who make the show, they cannot like it they will not read it they cannot yeah, legally yeah, they read won't. it because they it opens them up to lawsuits if anything they write mm-hmm. down the line is remotely well, that's similar it. It does to it. it like i say this this guy lost the case and then he appealed and, and i understand they there was some sort of out of court settlement do you know what i mean ultimately right um but he did officially like they, that was the decision because he was using copyrighted characters he therefore had no copyright on them mm. um so i thought that was quite interesting uh, but that was the the case. Not no, your your script has some ideas, but we think it wasn't a rip off. They they kind of accepted that it was a rip off. It was just you had no legal claim to it. Wow, that's really weird. I, I'm I'm surprised that's the way it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's dicey, I mean. isn't it, for writers? So what you're saying is, Alan, that when we pitch, you know, Rocky in space, and then they go <laughs> ahead and make it, we have no legal recourse to. I suspect we won't have any. Legal. You'll have to change all the names at the beginning. I have to say this but person can, is this we person. We can sue and kick up a lot of fuss, and hopefully just get a little settlement out of it. Well, we'll get some. We'll get some attention for the show. People will start listening. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, right. One last thing. Did you know that there was a Rocky musical? <laughs> no. You got. I. I played you a song from the Rocky musical. Have you? In the really? Little Shop of Horrors episode. Really? Does that mean you've listened to some of the songs then? I, remember, I, listened not, to I listened to like one clip to pull something out for you. I listened to the soundtrack album, but I didn't listen to it like all of it. I was like skipped through the songs and got I, a I of it have only gone. I've heard the one I played a clip from, which was him being like, "I've got to keep going, <laughs> got to stand <laughs> yeah. up." <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I did seem familiar when I listened to that. I know where I'm from. I know who I am. But yeah, it's pretty poor. <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> shit musical. Um, and it, well, it I mean, it's not. Broadway. I don't think it's made its way across the pond. So it's probably it was on Broadway great. and it ran for like six months, which I don't believe is a successful yeah, run yeah, in Broadway. Uh, but yeah, I listened to all the songs and it, they were just so shit. It was just all the same, very musical theater kind of. <laughs> no, no real personal flavor to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's yeah. nothing individual about it. And also, like, the main guy, he'd be like, 
Oh, hey, Adrian, you know, I think I like you so much, I'm going to sing you a song. My name is Rocky, I love Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> like he couldn't sing in the voice. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, how would you even... <laughs> well, exactly, but then don't no, do it. Then. If it's you'd speak, sing it. And I'm gonna yeah. Sing. Yeah, no, you wouldn't do a musical. You would not do a musical. That's true, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, like, I can see how you could be drawn to the world of boxing for a stage musical. It's, you know, choreograph. It's like a dance, isn't it? You, you could, I could see how someone might get it in their head. That's a good idea. It would appeal to those sort of masculine guys we've been talking about who'd be like, Oh wow, a musical that I can go and see and no one will call me queer or nothing and all that and <laughs> Oh, they will. So well, the, that that scene that it opens mm. with surfing mm-hmm. and I don't know why, but of all the things that we see Bond do, like he skis, that's no problem, fencing, no problem, but surfing, it just I just thought no. No, I don't buy that at all. <laughs> I don't it's buy jarring. that he can. It's it's it, it didn't work for me at all at the start. Now, weirdly enough, when when it kind of pays off later and he does it again, that was so bizarre and otherworldly. I kind of got on board with it, but it, it really reminded me of a Crash Bandicoot video game. Like, oh, what vehicle is he gonna use in this level? <laughs> It didn't feel very Bond-like again, I suppose. I, I think it's just like you say, there's there's a lack of dignity to it. <laughs> I think that I think that surfing is inherently show-offy, and James Bond is inherently show-offy, but in a way where he likes to pretend that he's not. Mm. Surfing is overtly performative, whereas most of what James Bond does is covertly performative Mm. because surfing is not a good practical form of transport you have to kind of paddle out and then it sort of pushes you back in Mm. like it's not something like i presume have they been dropped off a ship or something i I don't know have they jumped out of a plane on surfboards we don't see how they get there (laughs) but they just Mm. surf in into this thing it doesn't really make any sense well, yeah, I, I like the idea that they were just, yeah, paddling with their boards, waiting to catch catch wave, <laughs> Not a wipeout. And and you don't you don't hear them talk all those henchmen, but he's, of course they dudes. are California surfer dudes <laughs> that are being shipped in, <laughs> shouting things like wipeout and, and hang ten dudes. Cowabunga! And stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? Right, this film in general, I was made a lot of notes, but I made I made, I made two more, pages. Of yeah, notes. but I made more at the beginning though, and I think I just kept going. Well, it's, for me, it's like the Donald Trump effect. It's like, there's so much bullshit that you just have to stop. Yeah. <laughs> like, it just, it's too much. There's so much that you can't deal with one element of it. Like Yeah, that's normally how I feel with Bond. But I think this film actually did do a lot that I liked. Oh. Dare I be a bit positive. So I, I think my notes are going to reflect a kind of, oh, that's interesting. Oh, what is this shit? <laughs> Oh my god, you guys, Jesus Christ. I mean, this is a tangent, but I watched uh, I watched the 1948 Oliver Twist earlier today with Alec <laughs> Guinness as Fagin. Ooh. Oh my god. Oh my god, that was... Oh god. We've come a long way in, with regards to... <laughs> I mean, I just, I just couldn't... I couldn't believe that it was post-war. That's That was the most amazing thing. It was like this... It was like a Sasha Baron Cohen character. It was like a... <laughs> It, it was like a bit of World War Two propaganda. Well, how how does it compare to the the classic, the Ron Moody uh, version? Mm. Uh, is he the guy in the musical? Yeah. Yes. Oh no, it's it's far more offensive and far more. Oh. It, it's just it, and not as good actually. I I love Alec Guinness, but I was really unimpressed with his performance because all he did was do a silly voice. And, uh, <laughs> very glad to see you, Ivor. Very, aren't we, my dears? Yeah. yeah. And when you want Alec Guinness, you want him to be doing all oh, this talking in his f- normal funny voice. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, can I ask you, Sol, because I happened to watch this the other day. I watched some clips of Rowan Atkinson playing Fagin. Oh, really? Sorry, I didn't watch clips because uh, it was just audio. But he's did it on the stage relatively recently. Ten years ago, maybe. Oh, right. Yes, I remember. He did. You're right. Um... He did it very classically Ron Moody style, but with a bit more yeah, bit more emphasis on comedy. I think. I'm re 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 
you The situation Can the fella be a villain all his life? All these trials and tribulations Better settle down and get myself a wife It's only very recently that I've become aware of Fagin's... As a kid, I had no idea he was a kind of Jewish stereotype, but uh, I watched the musical Oliver for the first time in a long while a couple of years ago on Christmas Day, actually, with the family. It was just like, oh, that's a film we can pop on. That'll be nice. And, you know, the music's all like... And it was like, oh, God, he's... (laughs) Right, I get it now. Um, But I I will say the 1967 version makes Fagin far more of a rounded character in his own right, far more sympathetic, whereas the Alec Guinness one, it's like, oh, he's just a kind of snivelling rat. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Ron, Ron Moody was Jewish, so perhaps that helps. I don't know how accurate this is, but apparently the film, uh, the 48 Oliver Twist, was banned in Egypt and in... I think it was Egypt and Israel, but I'm going to double check that. Well, Israel only was created in 1948, I think, so <laughs> they they set up the chart and went, and that's banned, by the way, <laughs> while, we're, while we're doing the, this. Yeah, it was. It was Egypt and Israel. It was banned in both countries simultaneously upon its release. In Israel, it was banned for being anti-Semitic, <laughs> and in in Egypt, it was banned for making not Fagin... being anti-Semitic enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in Egypt, it was banned for not making <laughs> for making Fagin too sympathetic. Apparently, wow. So that's oh, that's a fascinating uh, sign of the times. <laughs> that is very interesting, actually. Yeah, I had no idea. Hmm. Okay, do you know what? I think it's time for more zombies. These clips are from episode 230, in which we were looking at Day of the Dead. And the first thing you're going to hear is actually me, hello, talking about the Day of the Dead remake in 2008, and the somewhat shoddy manufacturing of the DVD that they produced. And then there's going to be some talk of Land of the Dead, that's the one with Dennis Hopper in, And then finally, we end up talking about a cheap knockoff Night of the Living Dead remake because somebody forgot to renew the copyright and now everybody's making their own version of it. So let's give that one a listen. Well, let me, let me, I just want to address this DVD uh, box that I've got because um, yeah. I found it very interesting. Now, uh, first of all, the cover uh, doesn't have the picture of the actors on that you might expect. It's got pictures of sort of very generic kind of CGI zombies. Although upon close inspection, one of them does appear to be Ving Rhames, uh, but he's like right at the back. Mm. You couldn't tell it's him. The names it has on the, on the front, uh, it does have names. It says Mina Savari, Nick Cannon, Ving Rhames. So there you go. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. But what I really want to address here is the blurb on the back, okay. which I think th- this is going to demonstrate to you the care that has been put into this film. So uh, it says, D-Day is coming. Warning. The population of a small town in Colorado seems to have been infected by a virus with unknown origin. The flu-like symptoms usually consist of lethargy, cold sweats, nausea, discomfort, intense headaches, and a slight discolouring to their complexion. Bit wordy, (laughs) but okay so far. (laughs) And then this next sentence, it does have one comma in it somewhere, but other than that, (laughs) <laughs> Unfortunately, this is usually followed by a sudden urge to savagely rip the limbs from any living creature that might stand in their way whilst chewing on their bones, sucking out their brains, and chewing on their flesh. Use of chewing <laughs> using, twice there. Use of chewing pretty, twice there, obviously. Yeah, pretty bad copy. That, didn't uh, have a thesaurus yeah, then. Uh, that wouldn't pass my exactly, uh, yeah, yeah. editorial eye in my profession. Next sentence. Um, an elite cold-blooded and tenate... Cold-blooded, not cold-blooded... An elite, (laughs) cold-blooded, and tenacious military force has been sent in to clean up the mess. Full stop. But but whereas, whereas as two separate words, but whereas some residents are more than willing to spend the rest of their short lives in quarantine, no comma, a small group of survivors escape and head towards an uncertain demise, no comma, unaware of the eyeball-chomping, gut-splurting nightmare that awaits them. You can tell they've really put all their effort into coming up with, like, body parts. <laughs> they could say the zombies eat and ways of eating. Even more interesting thing about that is that that... Slurping, that sucking, is, chewing twice. 
that is not a particularly good description of the plot. <laughs> it's a sort of vague, it's like you watched this film two years ago and they said, what happens in that film? Um... Well, no, it's, it's like someone said, can you write us a bit of copy? Uh, I'll buy you a McDonald's. And they went, <laughs> oh yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, they went, do you, want me to, do you want to send me the film so I can watch it? <laughs> uh, it's just a zombie movie. Just, okay. just yeah, write a generic zombie thing. <laughs> Hmm. And then the other weird thing on here is that it it says starring the irresistible Mina Suvari. It just seemed a weird hmm. adjective to use on a DVD cover. Irresistible. I mean, yeah. she's very attractive. Well, don't get me wrong. Zombies want to chew yeah. her <laughs> eyes out or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and it also says um, this reimagining of George Romero's horror classic is a minefield of extreme gore and violence that takes the zombie genre to a new level of savagery. So very much selling it on a bit of gore there, which I don't know if it... It doesn't feel like any more gory than any other zombie film, frankly. It was less gory hmm. than the original Day of the Dead. <laughs> Substantially so. I mean, we, we, we didn't touch on it, but the, the original Day of the Dead has a very iconic uh, among the horror community scene where a man's head is ripped off and as he screams, his scream goes high-pitched because his vocal cords are being oh, extended. Yeah. Whereas this film just kind of has some people getting shot. Yeah. <laughs> Land of the Dead was produced for an R rating. It got a 15 certificate in the UK. But that isn't the kind of intended cut. There, There's a scene left out to achieve that rating, which is why on DVD in the UK it's an 18. I think it might be just one of those unrated director's cuts in America. Hmm. But he obviously made that compromise of like, right, I'll I'll cut this scene for, you know, the sake of Universal making a bit of money in the cinemas and then we can put it out on DVD. That's fine. I'm going to assume you guys watch the director's cut, which is... Uh, it just has the scene where Cholo responds to a man who's hanged himself in the Fiddler's Green bit. No. Oh, you didn't see that? I just saw whatever was on Netflix. Yeah, I don't I know. Uh... Netflix. Oh, okay. Maybe that's not the director's cut then. No. Oh, right. Oh, maybe it is just on the D. I just thought that had become the standard cut. Uh, yeah, basically, he when he goes up to visit Kaufman, Kaufman, to say that, you know, to give him a drink and say he's going to buy a place and all that, mm. just before that, he's going up there. His butler guy is like, oh, God, like scared and about to shoot him. He's like, what's up? And he's like, oh, I heard a noise. He goes into another flat. There's a, a woman crying. A man's hanged himself. He's trying to calm the woman down. But then the guy's son runs in and goes, dad, oh, my God. And like runs to try and get him untied and obviously becomes a zombie and bites the son. And oh. John Leguizamo picks up a, a is, is it like an adult son? He's not like a child. Mm. He picks up like a trophy or a an ornament or something and just like bash it bludgeons his head <laughs> with it basically mm. and then the security finally turn up late and he's so the guy's like what the hell happened and he's like it's your problem clean it up or something and like walks off and then mm. when uh when we see him talking to kaufman Kauf, i keep saying kaufman when we see him talking to dennis hopper <laughs> <laughs> he says something like oh i heard what you did in in my neighbor's flat thanks for sorting it out or something i don't know if that's in the other cut or not but that's pretty much the only difference to does to not the best ring of my a knowledge. bell there might be some other shots of gore in there as well uh, i don't know there's some there's some extremely gory bits in the <laughs> in the film but um... well there's all lots of gore like there was in fact there was one shot that i quite that i thought was quite fantastic actually it's like a hand holding up and there's like mist and then the yeah. hand is like ripped apart from like in between the fingers and i thought oh, but god, it's done in silhouette shot. isn't it yeah it's kind of this arty shot yeah which i quite like i thought it was like oh god that looks fantastic mm. um there was, there was the occasional moment like that there's a bit where they like rip a guy's skin off over his face from his mouth, which is very unpleasant, but realised really well. Oh, I thought that was yeah. There's one point where a zombie's like sticking their hand in the mouth of oh, some yeah, dead person bit, yeah. to like eat them, up. pulling was... organs out through the mouth of a corpse. Yeah. Yeah. When this first came out, was this kind of like to zombie fans what like the Phantom Menace is to like Star Wars fans? Because <laughs> I, after coming after the likes of Twenty Eight Days Later. 
the Dawn of the Dead remake, um, Shaun of the Dead, like, relatively, like, they all kind of made their mark on the genre in different ways. And then, you know, this must have had so much hype because it's George A. Romero coming back to the mm. zombie thing. I, I read a quote from um, Guillermo del Toro that I thought was quite funny. I've got it here about, uh, finally, someone was smart enough to realize that it was about time and gave George the tools. It should be a cause of celebration amongst all of us that Michelangelo has started in this, another ceiling. <laughs> it really is a momentous occasion. And I'm like, I know that he likes his hyperbole, but that is, I mean, <laughs> was he disappointed when he saw the final film? Were people uh, like, oh, this is, um, this is it? I, I think it's more comparable to The Force Awakens, if I'm completely honest. Okay. It's, you know, Day of the Dead was a disappointment when it came out in the kind of general consensus, uh, the zeitgeist, but, you know, it's become reevaluated. Not that I'm suggesting that's what happened with The Phantom Menace, um, although I know it does have its fans. No, I mean, it, Land of the Dead, it wasn't, it didn't meet with a terrible reaction, you know, it's it got good reviews. Hmm. It's got 74% certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, I, I think... I think it was kind of more mixed reaction among fans, you know, plenty of whom loved it, plenty of whom thought it was fucking stupid. I I think people's main issue came down to just how stupid and unbelievable the smart zombies thing is with Big Daddy, really. That was what people took issue with. Mm -hmm. And it was just down to whether or not you go with that or not. And and I think it's a shame because I think the idea of a smart zombie leading a kind of revenge mission is a solid idea for the film. I just don't think it's done very well. I, I, it's not handled properly. But, you know, I, I you know, I, I wasn't disappointed with it when I saw it. I, I, there was definitely a lot of hype, you know. I, I've kind of... My opinion of it has gone down with uh, repeat viewings and a bit of perspective, which I know is something you're very familiar with, Calvin, from uh, James Bond. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just looking now, it, 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 its box office was, according to Wikipedia, 46.8 million on a budget of 15 to 19 million dollars, so... Three times its money then, yeah. Yeah, Does that include marketing costs and stuff though? Probably not, but mm. it also doesn't include DVD sales, and bear in mind this was exactly the kind of film that do very well on DVD, circa the height of <laughs> DVDs being a thing with a special director's cut and everything. So, Like I say, my, my understanding is it was very comfortably profitable, Universal were happy with it, and mm. wanted a sequel, and George Romero was presented with an option to kind of make Land of the Dead 2, essentially. And he, he kind of opted to step back and make a consciously much smaller film with Diary of the Dead, where he'd have more complete creative control. Although I do find that weird, because it's difficult to watch this film and feel like George Romero didn't have complete creative control over it. It's mm-hmm. such a weird film in a lot of ways, and messy. It doesn't it doesn't really feel like a studio were breathing down his neck the whole time. I mean, for God's sake, they, they let him cast Dario Argento, uh, Asia Argento, you know? It's, <laughs> it's not even like they said, right, you've got to put this person in, they're the new big star. <laughs> it might not have even been, like, demands. It might have just been that he just doesn't like notes very much. So even on sort of, like, smaller scenes yeah. or fates of characters or something, like, you know, there's this kind of, they kind of bundle um, Dennis Hopper's death because it's sort of, it's mm. the zombie be that gets the killing really but then John Leguizamo's come back for revenge and it I, I don't know in one version I could imagine that they're setting it up like zombie John Leguizamo's gonna take care of him yeah mm. and then that isn't what happens it's uh... like that felt like a note to me that felt like someone's like actually yeah. this zombie character's really cool and he should get the big hero moment but yeah Maybe. I don't know some things felt a bit botched yeah and I wouldn't be surprised if Simon Baker was a studio Mm. casting choice, you know. Maybe it was originally meant to be Cholo with John Leguizamo mm. in the lead. That's more the sensibility of... Or, or to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if George Romero wrote it with Big Daddy as the protagonist <laughs> yeah. and had to work backwards from there. But but it largely does feel like a, maybe it's just the responsibility of playing in a bigger field that he didn't like. I don't know. Mm. I think even Alan would agree with me that some of the Night of the Living Dead remakes are, you know, 
unfathomably bad. I actually missed one, you know? No. Oh. I saw the other day that there's, um, I think it was Gemma Arterton oh. on her IMDb page. I th- ah, am I thinking of the right person? I and mean, it's a weird name for me to pull out of it. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> it just was a weird name. Is there an act, an actor from an actress from Manchester Loads of who's got a name like Gemma Arterton but isn't Gemma Arterton? This is going to be like a soap star or something. Gemma Atkinson or something <laughs> like that. Is, is that it? I have no idea. It, it was like a soap star. Yeah, I've got it. Here we are. Gemma Atkinson <laughs> from Hollyoaks. Oh. Made a or not made, but starred in a <laughs> night of Night of the Living 3D Dead. She played Barbara in 2013. You know, there's a lot of these things, and given how hard it was for me to just dig up this film now, knowing vaguely the year and someone in it, there's probably a lot more that we don't know about. Hmm. Public domain. Do you think we could scrape together enough money to make our own version of Night of the Living Dead? I don't think we'd need a budget to top <laughs> the Welsh one. Yeah, genuinely, I, I we're not like so amazingly talented that we're infallible no, or anything. But I think the three of us are talented enough that if we just improvised a Night of the Living Dead remake <laughs> between the three of us, like one day, I think it would be better than that Welsh film. Hmm. Shot on an iPhone, probably look better, to be honest. It, you know, it, it was just a little... That's more a comment on how um, film camera technology has progressed in the last ten years than anything, though. This Gemma Atkinson one looks pretty bad. I'm just uh, watching the trailer now. Ooh, there's a trailer, is there? I'm going to look that up and uh. watch with you. I don't get... They're obsessed with making them 3D <laughs> as well at a certain point. The thing is, I don't even see how this could be 3D. Is it actually in 3D or is it just called... 3D Dead. Night of well, the... I know, it's called Night of the Living 3D Dead, but there's at least two other 3D Night of the Living Deads. I mean, they are technically 3D. <laughs> the zombies. Well, humans are. In the reality of the film. Okay, I mean, this is looking very low budget, but it's also looking a hell of a lot better than the other remakes I've watched. Like, there's a... Give it a minute. (laughs) There's an attempt to artistry behind the cinematography, even if it's obviously not been made by people with the technical know-how or the equipment to do it really well. But it is just Gemma Atkinson looking (laughs) upset in various... Yeah, they couldn't afford any of the Atkinson. Was that just a shot of her in front of a green screen on the sofa and they haven't done (laughs) <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I think it's just a, the color of the wall. <laughs> it looks like something's. Ha- oh no, you're right. It's the wall. Oh my yeah. gosh, that it looks like, like a, they were hanging a set we would build in a student film. Yeah, that is like yeah. three panels. It looks <laughs> with wallpaper on it. Oh, that bit out of focus. That was shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's cut his head off on that framing there. Oh, oh, that man outside's meant to be a zombie. The wall. <laughs> I mean, the choice of her green oh. walls is. A, this whole thing is obviously set in this one room. Hmm. This looks like a very avant-garde... The- it looks like a, f- um, a filmed stage show, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Which oh, is that's a good point, a, yeah. A pretty, pretty cool idea, I think, to um, hmm. remake the film set in one room. But, I mean, yeah, it doesn't look like they've done a particularly good job of it. Mm-hmm. But that does look a hell of a lot better than (laughs) at least three of the Night of the Living Dead remakes that I uh, watched or investigated for our episode that we did. Hmm. Well, if anyone knows what became of that Gemma Atkinson film, or indeed Gemma Atkinson herself, please do let us know. Now for something completely different. Mary Poppins. I've never really understood the appeal of Julie Andrews. I, I have the exact the exact same thing with Julia Roberts. They're just these people who are inexplicably <laughs> totally different people. <laughs> yeah, no, but they're, they're two they're two actors who are inexplicably massive names that people love and think are amazing. But I've never once seen them. In, they're just completely plain and. They, I don't I, know, I've oof, never seen them God, in anything no. where I've thought I mean I'm not where I've thought they've brought anything special to anything. Julie Andrews is now a name where if they drop and Julie Andrews as 
the sentient flannel. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, <laughs> Julie Andrews is in it. Certainly, her best films are in the sixties. I, I, I don't think she. This is probably, you know, I mean, it is her most. This and Maria from The Sound of Music are a two iconic yeah. roles. See, I've never and... seen The Sound of Music. That might be. You've never seen probably. The Sound of Music. That might be the problem I've got here. Yeah. <gasps> That's one of her big ones, isn't it? That's one of her big films. <laughs> oh my god. One of? It's the only other one. <laughs> in fact, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. one. She actually has to do stuff in that film. Yeah, that's probably why I, I don't get it. Oh my it? god. Alan, <laughs> Alan, for your next pick on the podcast, please pick The Sound of Music. That's one of my New Year's films, actually. I watched their oh most New god. Year's. That one's even longer, <laughs> so like, that's about three hours. I was going to say it's like three and a half hours long. That's why I've never watched it. But it's brilliant. Oh my god. Brilliant. Oh, please, 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 can we do it at some point? Please. <laughs> I, I was reading about David Tomlinson, and this is completely like not really connected to the film, but mm. he was he was married right in the forties to a woman. Oh, yeah. She'd been widowed. Her husband had died in the war, and she had two she had two kids, and then she remarried to to David Tomlinson. But yeah, like three months after they got married, she took her kids and jumped off a roof or, or a hotel roof or something. Basically, oh, sh- a, a old murder, kill mm. your kids, and suicide thing. So that's what he was dealing with. <laughs> like that was twenty years before this film, right? But I think he became a bit of an eccentric old man in his later life. He lived in some rural area of England, and he had like a old biplane or something, and he'd just go out in his local village and fly really low and sort of taunt people with it. <laughs> and like the local people got really annoyed with him. <laughs> yeah, that's what he did in the war. He flew in the war, isn't he? Right. He just flew a plane really low, harassing people, <laughs> shouting like beep beep. <laughs> and, like, they had to like duck to the ground. Have you ever uh, seen uh, Bedknobs and Broomsticks? It's the only other film yes. I know him from. Right? Yeah, he's in that. That's as well. that's what I know him from. I I I did see Bedknobs and Broomsticks as a child. I I, mm. I mean, oh interesting. I, I think I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but I I happen to think it's a far far superior film to Mary oh. Poppins. Hmm. I might it's agree the with scrappy that, underdog. It's it's the the Futurama compared to the Simpsons, the Indiana <laughs> Jones to the Star Wars. It's it's, it's the sister <laughs> film that's just better. Hmm. Maybe we'll get there someday too. Well, Kevin Smith has said he wants to remake it. What? So bed and a while ago. Yeah, they'll never let him. <laughs> <laughs> Someone asked him if he'd want to do one of these live-action Disney remakes, and he said, "Like, well, you know, it's not quite, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to do Bedknobs and Broomsticks." But yeah. yeah, Disney, no, no way, Disney's ever going to let him anywhere near anything they own. <laughs> <laughs> At best, he might get to direct an episode of like whatever Muppets TV show they're working on. <laughs> is Dave is is Dave Van Dyke still alive? Yes, oh, yeah. he's in the new one. Well, I know, but he could have died last year. Oh, and... Fair enough. Yeah, no, he's an eccentric old man now. I saw a video of him around Halloween time where he was getting his place kitted out with this very elaborate troll thing that was going to like jump out of a bush. And then it just showed <laughs> some. He was at like the end of his driveway, and some kids were walking up, and he was like, "Come on, kids, got some candy for you." And then the <laughs> troll thing jumps out, and the kids just run away screaming while he laughs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just he's been in that old man mode for as long as I can remember. He's kind of been like a Bruce Forsyth figure, but like the American equivalent. Yeah. And of course they share a scene together in Bed Nubs and Broomsticks. Bruce yeah. Forsyth? Yeah. Do they? Yes. Bruce Forsyth is the uh, assistant to the bookkeeper guy who wants to what? buy that boy's knob. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know Bruce what? Forsyth it makes sense acted? if you see the film. Yeah. Yes! He's a, he was a all round. <laughs> Sorry, that was Dick Van Dyke chirping up again. Wow. <laughs> yes! Yeah, of course he was. I worked with him all the time <laughs> on the old London Palladium. <laughs> oh, God. What other songs are there? Feed the Birds. Oh, God. Yeah, that's just, a boring just, What's the just, one that was really crap? Love to Laugh. Oh, I mean, that is that is the worst, isn't it? The bank no, people have a song that they sing. And yeah, the bank one's bit. dreadful too. Choreography too. We like being in a bank. <laughs> oh, I put too much energy into it. <laughs> That's one of my favourite scenes in the film, by the way, when the people in the bank hear the boy shouting, oh, give me back my money, and they, yeah, and they cause some kind of recession, financial I collapse. love that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> financial crisis, because the kid... <laughs> Someone! The bank won't give someone their money. <laughs> that is, well, they're not that getting is quite mine. a good uh, metaphor for the fragility of the economy, though. Between that and all the suffragette stuff, I thought, oh no, this is as biting satire as ever. <laughs> Bit of a sidebar here, but I would much prefer it if, like, uh, we have the credits 
uh, to start the film and then the very first thing we see is it kind of zooms into a cloud and she's there like doing a makeup and she's got a bag there and everything yeah, getting ready yeah, yeah and then we go the down and then the rest of the listening film. to uh, I... <laughs> I got a feeling by the black eyed peas <laughs> i do wonder if that was like an addition afterwards like it was like, oh god she doesn't turn up until like 20 minutes into the film we need to get her up there like you know front and center very quickly because it's a much better entrance when she just kind of flies in and if they didn't have that bit of her sat on the cloud at the top of the film, mm. I think it would have played better. Because uh, then there'd be no magic until the letter is sucked out of the chimney mm. and she comes flying in. One of the biggest problems I have with the film is that you're kind of you're clearly meant to get this sense that she's some you know magical being who, who transcends like all sorts of stuff. But then you only ever get the sense that she like lives down the street, like she knows Bert really well. <laughs> And Uncle Albert, or whatever his name is, the laughing guy. And and if she's just someone who like lives on the same road and happens upon this family, it, it just takes... I don't know, it doesn't feel as magical and special, does it? I think it's just that she's been around so much that you could be on literally any street and you'd find someone who <laughs> spent some time with her. But then that takes away from how fantastical it all is, because everyone would just be like... Oh, do you see all those nannies get blown down the street? Oh, p- bloody Mary Poppins at it again, is she? Oh. Not even down the street, like up in the air, like they're like yeah, with no, not feet. not even <laughs> reacting to what's happening, just stone faced, <laughs> no screaming. That's what bothered. evil spinsters are all like, though, isn't it? They wouldn't even care. They'd just be glad that the Lord was taking them. <laughs> We're being raptured. <laughs> <laughs> So that was Mary Poppins. Uh, That was episode 133, if you want to go and listen to the whole thing. And now I'm going to leave you with some sexy clips from our Fifty Shades Free... And when I say sexy, please don't get overexcited. Actually, just filthy. But yes, it's from Fifty Shades Freed. We have done three Fifty Shades episodes in which we mostly just talk about our own sex lives. This one was the third of the trilogy. Episode 141... And here's the bits that were cut out because they were too hot for podcasting. I had quite an eye-opening experience this weekend, if you'll let me uh, digress. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, yes. Um, right, so, uh, <laughs> I, I, I need to tell you all of the... St- it's probably going to build up and not be very interesting to you, but uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get there. Um, yeah. Right, so... Recently, someone at work was uh, going on about how she was going to go and see Fifty Shades of... Not Fifty Shades of Grey, sorry, Rocky Horror Picture Show <laughs> at the <laughs> uh, at the cinema. And that made me think, oh, wow, I've got that on Blu-ray. And then I thought, why do I even have that on Blu-ray? I don't like it that much. And then I remembered. You love Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, we were probably talking about it at university when I bought it because there was a guy who I was chatting You've to got online... The- who... It's got the guy from James Bond in it. That's why you love. Oh, him. I love him in it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so there was a guy who I was chatting to online. I think I might have met him once or something, um, th- through a mutual friend, and uh, he said that it was his favorite film. And I drunkenly bought it one night, uh... trying to, you know, uh, impress uh... him. And then anyway, he ended up with a girl and they had a kid. And um, I didn't speak <laughs> to him for about um. Oh, probably about five years, and then that just made me think, oh, I've got that film, oh, why do I have it? Oh, because of that guy, right, okay then. Um, and then the very, the day after that, it was, uh, he popped up as like, uh, this is this person's birthday on Facebook, so I was like, oh, okay then, so I'll have a look on his um, Facebook, see what he's like now. Uh, and then there was just one message from someone saying, hope you're a peace now with the angels up above and all this kind of stuff. So I was like, oh wow, I guess he's dead then. And then I got... Live fast, die young. I got in touch with our... um, They found him with an orange full of amphetamines in his mouth and a stocking on his head. (laughs) Well, I I, I asked our only mutual friend, sort of like, oh, did you keep in touch with him? Like, what happened? And uh, and he said, oh, that's sad. Uh, No, I didn't really, but... uh, I did see that porn that he did. That was really weird. And I was, I was like, <laughs> wow. what? Yeah, that was my reaction. And then I was like, what? Calvin, they, they, this could be an NPR podcast. Like, if you, if you dragged each plot development out to half an hour, <laughs> this would be the next big S-Town serial 
this would be amazing. Yeah. Well, anyway, I need to do better research because I was like, oh, well, this is, you know, I was like, oh, well, I'll, I'll, you know, what, what was it like? Do you have a link to it? And he said, no, no, no. And I was like, okay, well, probably we'll never see it. And they said, well, it was a bit, it was a bit surprising, really. There was a like piss involved and bondage, oh, and <laughs> I recognised him because of his tattoos. And I was like, oh, okay, then. Well, this sounds like a good lead to go on because you know, British tattoo, piss, bondage. <laughs> How much, you know. That, I mean, that's a lot of niche in one. Like, that can't possibly <laughs> be, you know, I'm sure I'll type that in and there'll be, like, one or two anyway. There were <laughs> thousands, and I spent the best part of an evening going through most of these, and I wasn't aroused by most of what I was seeing. I was just sort of... Every time I'd come across one with sort of similar arm <laughs> tattoos, I'd watch, like, five minutes. Well, not actually that much, oh, actually. I, I, I know what you mean. I... I... <sighs> Anyway, I, I didn't I find it. A, um, That's the end of the story. I, yeah, I, I have not a friend, but like a, a, an acquaintance, basically, who who got into porn. And like, believe me, I watched a lot of it to say <laughs> that I don't find her attractive. Um, it's just very compelling, isn't it? Um, yeah. It's just like... Wow, this is weird. Like, I wasn't going to it to be like, I'm going to have a wank over Zach this. And Mary make a porn well, yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to it like, oh, I'll have a good, good old night with this. I was just going <laughs> yeah, for more yeah. morbid curiosity. Oh yeah, completely. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't find it, and then I just sort of gave up. But um, that leads me to my next question: Have you ever tried pissing when you've had an erection? Because <laughs> <laughs> I saw a lot of it in these videos, and I didn't think it was something that was possible. And some people looked like they were really like. Like when they were leading up to it, and I wondered, yeah, does it hurt? Got, have you not ever tried doing that? I... Being while having an erection? No. Well, it'd go up in the air. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it does. You just point it down, push it forcibly down. I, I, mm-hmm. well, I, I used to do a lot more of this than I guess this is just getting older. <laughs> but when I was younger, it was like I can't wait for that to go down. It's going to take too long. I need to wee, and so you go to the bathroom, and then you. What I'd sort of do a lot of the time is this really awkward kind of bending forwards where you kind of lean over to Hand like on the system. try and angle it down as much as possible. Uh. Um, and it was very uncomfortable, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, you can do it. How long does it take um, to go down? Three or four hours. <laughs> What, an erection? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't ever need to wee that badly uh, that I can't wait. Um, I don't know, I was thinking about this the other day, actually. <laughs> like, po- uh, and, and this is your final warning, listener. Like, we're, we're going to get graphic <laughs> in this episode. Um, post, post-ejaculating, <laughs> it takes me a long time to go down. <laughs> Alan's mum has just put uh, a <laughs> uh, mobile phone in her hand of rage. Hearing this. But, in the, but in the middle, like, if I'm interrupted and, like, I have to go answer the door or something, I can go up and down like that. It's not a problem. It's just, for some reason, after you've come, it's like, it's just going to stay up for ages. Yeah. Hmm. Do you not find no, that? No, I'm sort of the opposite. Really? Once you're done, you're done. Yeah, I think that's the wrong way around, isn't it? I don't know why it does that for me. Mm. It's a bit weird. Hmm. Yeah. It's like it's like oh, I forgot to, I want to put my I want to put my fucking pants on and go to sleep and <laughs> and then it'll be like poking out the top of the pants. It's like will you bloody <laughs> stop it? Mm. Well, to to answer your question, Calvin, the reason they're all pissing with an erection is because they're taking Viagra, so that just sort of helps you maintain. Ah, you know. That explains it. Yeah. I don't like using the urinals when other people I work with are like using the urinals next <laughs> to them at work. Oh, I never go at work because it's just like. I mean, I don't mind peeing next to a man, but it's like when you know the person and you have like mm. a day-to-day relationship with them, it's just a bit weird, isn't it? When it's not a friend, so, when it's like a colleague, yeah, yeah that, that's what I find awkward, because it's like, oh, I only know you in this sort of capacity, and this feels very intimate. I have a way, when I was 17, right? <laughs> the fact that I remember this story should suggest it's weird, even though it's not that big a thing. But I was at a friend's 18th birthday party, and I went to the toilet, and it was like this big do, right? And I went to the toilet, and his dad came in. Now, I didn't know his dad, but his dad was also a teacher at the school. So I kind of oh, knew no. his face and knew him a little bit. And so we both stood at the urinal, and he decides that Hello, time Mr. to, like, Johnson. ask me about my life and, like, how what I'm planning to do after college and all this sort of thing, like, oh, while we stood dear. having a piss. And it was just like, and it wasn't that weird or anything, but I remember that. From I don't like know, that sounds pretty weird. Many years ago. Or maybe it wasn't in those days. I suppose that was... <laughs> All right, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit 
of a while ago. It was definitely pre Jimmy Savile. <laughs> no, there was nothing. Se- there's no sexual element. Or nothing untoward about it. It was just like he was totally felt free to just chat while he was pissing. Right. And I and I was like, oh, hello. <laughs> that's exactly the kind of thing I try to avoid at work. Yeah. That's how Thank you for listening. Do follow us on the social media at Dim Returns Pod. And if you enjoy the show, then do rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us create a bigger audience, and that'd be really good. Thanks. And if you are really a fan of the show, then you can support us on patreon.com forward slash Dim Returns for a very, very small amount of money. And you get extra content, so go and do that as well. You know you want to. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll just leave you with one more clip. I saw a really annoying thing on TV at the weekend, just about veganism being trendy. Uh, there was this lady who was on Channel 4 Breakfast Program talking about a Segan diet, where oh. it's basically... it's she, she, she described it as, well, it's it's all like really tasty vegan dishes, uh, but it's got fish in it. Fuck and it's that like, well, that's not... shit. Fuck no, exactly. off. Just... Fuck right off. <laughs> It really angered me because it's like, well, it's just not. And even the presenters were sort of it's like, well, pres- it's not pescatarian, then, is it? Well, yeah, exactly. Mm. And that's what they were saying. It's like, well, it's already pescatarian. And she was like, no, no, no. But the difference is that this has no dairy or whatever in it. And it's like, well, it's still got fish in it, though, yeah. hasn't Who it? Who cares about fish? Eh? Yeah, Fuck yeah. Em. I really hate. Like, fair enough if you if you if you're pescatarian for like reasons other than ethics, but I. And believe me, like, believe me when I say I, I've got the utmost respect for, for vegetarians and vegans. I, I think, you know, fair play. I, I completely agree with it ethically. I'm just not a good enough person to care enough to, like, mm. not eat meat. But pescatarians, fuck right off. Ethical pescatarians. Because cause fuck off. Like, what? You, you think <laughs> it's ethically wrong to eat animals, but you're totally fine eating a... boiling a crab or, like, a lobster alive and eating a chopping a fish's head off and smashing its head in with a hammer when you catch it to kill it like i'd happily do that yeah but then you wouldn't make a thing about you'd happily do that to a lovely cow or a oh cows yeah definitely yeah Uh, i like to think i would i I hope i wouldn't be squeamish yeah and and, like you know I, i at least you know I'm an equal opportunities meat eater i'd eat i'd eat human if it was ethically sourced so oh no i wouldn't do that I know humans. I wouldn't eat dog. I mean, I'd definitely <laughs> eat dog. I would revel in eating dog. And then everyone goes, oh, you can't eat a dog. I'd be like, I fucking can, mate. Yeah. Watch me. Watch me go. Because dogs are nice. I'd, I'd kill a dog, but I wouldn't want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs>